Welcome back to WCCF Tech TV everyone, it's Keith once again and today we're talking about Ryzen 3000 series APUs. Now a couple things I want to get out of the way real quick. One, these are not 7 nanometer parts, they are not to be confused with Zen 2 based CPUs and we'll get into actually what's in here in just a moment. And two, if you are here about and you're looking at these and you're a high performance enthusiast, these may not be parts for you unless you're building a secondary system for little Johnny in the living room who wants to play a few games on it as well. With that out of the way, let's jump right into it. So what are the Ryzen 3000 series, Ryzen 5 3400G and the Ryzen 3 3200G? Well, they are the upgraded version of the Ryzen 3 2200G and the Ryzen 5 2400G. So these are APUs, they have four cores, and this one has simultaneous multi-threading, meaning four cores, eight threads, four cores only, but they both have integrated graphics. Vega graphics, Vega 8, Vega 11. And they, well, they perform a little bit better than their previous counterparts. And part of the way they did that is these are running Zen Plus rather than the original Zen cores. So the original Ryzen 2000 series Raven Ridge parts had Zen cores, but with an upgraded memory controller along with the Vega integrated graphics. And that was all running on 14 nanometer. Well, moving down to 12 nanometer, they were able to get better clocks as well as better efficiency. Now, one of the things they did do was they soldered these parts so the heat transfer is a lot better. And for the bigger boy, they upgraded the cooler so that you got the bigger Wraith Spire. Despite my complaints about it not having the copper slug, you'll see later that the thermals are just fine with this one on the, this setup, but the Ryzen 3 comes with the stealth cooler that the previous generation one came with. So the Ryzen 5 2400G and the 2200G came with this little bitty boy and they're all 65 watt parts. We did all of our testing on the B450 Tomahawk motherboard here with the latest BIOS at the time. And I can't recall the name of number on that one, but it is I think the third one that they released for Ryzen 3000 series parts. But the B450 Tomahawk is a solid board and performs where you would need it to. It's actually been replaced now by the B450 Tomahawk Max, which has a bigger BIOS so that you get to retain all the pretties in your BIOS as well as full functionality for previous CPUs that it supported. But we took that and now we did load in an NVMe drive on here. It's a Crucial P1, but that was just so that we could get through the testing a little bit quicker. If you want to use an NVMe drive in here, I hope you're not planning on using an add-in video card because you're going to take up some of your eight PCIe Gen 3 lanes that you have on here. These do not support PCIe Gen 4, that is Zen, or Zen 2, so the 3600 and up have that support but you got eight PCIe Gen 3 slots. If you use an NVMe drive, you're gonna take up a good portion of that and leaving very little over for your GPU. So use a SATA drive or you can use NVMe if you don't plan on using a high powered add-in board. Memory wise, we went with the Corsair Vengeance LPX. Now this is an eight gigabyte kit of DDR4-3000. Now before anybody has a panic because I didn't use 16 gigs and all of that jazz, these are budget setups. This is a $45 kit of RAM and this is a $100 part and $150 part, so $45 worth of memory for that. I'd like to have more RAM, but honestly, I went back and I double-checked the numbers on, that I got with this with a kit that has double the capacity and the performance numbers were the same. So, and I'll get into those settings as we go through the games here shortly, but this is DDR4-3000 and paired up with it, it, it supports 2933 out of the box for memory for both of these chips, so that's right about what the supported number is. And when we go into the performance results, the 2400G is ran at stock too, and you'll get those baseline performance because it also supported 2933 memory, but we did overclock the memory. We got the memory up to 3200 megahertz stable across all tests. I was able to get it up to 3400, but it was a little flaky. It wouldn't finish Dota 2, so I backed it back down so that we could get all of the games tested, completely stable, and this is, again, Got it up to 3200 CL16, and it is uh, running Hynix MFR dies on there. So in case anybody's wondering what dies, and they are single rank. Now as far as overclocking the iGPU, we got the Vega 8 in the 3200G up to 1750 megahertz, and the Vega 11 in the 3400G all the way up to 1725, which is very impressive because in the previous generation, while I was able to get the Vega 8 and the Vega 11 in the 2000 series up to 1600 megahertz, it was at 1.25 volts on the SOC voltage, whereas this was able to do it with 1.2 with some room left. 
left. In fact, the 3200G had a bit left in the tank, but I had to tone it down because this cooler, well, you'll see shortly, had a bit of trouble keeping up with it. If they boxed in this bigger one, been a whole different story. Probably could have got 1800 out of it. But we did test every game that we're going to talk about as well as the bench, the, the thermals and such on this board and we did it in the Masterbox Q500L so that we did it in, it's not really a best case scenario, but it's still in a case and it's a very basic case when it comes to thermals and all of that jazz. So we compared the 2400G at baseline to these two chips at baseline, then these two chips with just the memory overclock, and then the memory plus the iGPU to see kind of where things ended up with it. So the games that we test that we're gonna look at, I pulled them all from the Steam survey. Well, not all of them, most of them came from the Steam top 10 survey. If I had the game, we ran it. I did try to do PUBG. I'm gonna be honest with you, you don't really wanna run PUBG on this. It really just, you're gonna have to run it at 720p, and you're gonna have to turn settings way down to get even close to playable. Fortnite was okay at 1080p low settings, but the replay that I was trying to use to get the performance by the time I changed chips, the game got an update and I was like, you know what, fine, be that way. So PUBG and Fortnite are not in these benchmarks, but PUBG, I'm telling you right now, not a, go, a no go. Fortnite, you can get by if you're okay with low. And if you wanna turn it on the render settings, you get it even better. These games all came from top played games and let's stop talking about these and let me get right into the results. Let's start things off with a synthetic and we're gonna use, it's gonna be 3D Mark Night Raid. And feel free to run it on your own if you've never seen the results for it. But we see here where the 2400G started off and a lot of these things here in this graph is just to see scaling between the chips, mostly with the 3200G once the memory's overclocked and then the GPU plus the memory. And then you can see the 3400G is quite a bit stouter even at stock than uh, the 3200. But if you pay attention to the memory OC, you'll see that the fully overclocked 3200G is fairly close in graphics to where the 3400G with just the memory OC is. Uh, let's jump into games. We're gonna do all these at 1080p, so I just wanna get that out of the way real quick. These are all 1080p hottest games that people are actually playing. GTA 5, boom, super playable on this chip. In fact, the 3400G with the memory OC delivers a phenomenal gaming experience. And you can see here, just like with Night Raid, the 3200G plus the memory OC come right there along with the, D the 3400G with the memory overclock. Now that was that is GTA 5 with all normal settings at 1080p, so everything just set to normal. Moving into Counter-Strike Global Offensive at 1080p low settings, but with FXAA and Apple, and we're using the, the the game's benchmark, not really the game's benchmark, but the community benchmark. And you see here, the average frame rate is fairly impressive. In fact, the fully overclocked 3200G, once again, matches the 3400G with the memory OC. Now, something to keep in mind there is that very low 0.1% and the 1% lows is because of a smoke scene halfway through there that really, really tanks the performance and slows it down to a crawl but it's something to keep in mind. Moving into Dota 2 with the second from the left quality preset and the rendering at 100%, we see here fairly decent performance for this game. Uh, if you turn it all the way down, you turn all the details down, you get really, really good performance. But you see here, once again, the fully unlocked 3200G comes right there with a 3400G. In fact, they have the exact same performance numbers. Now moving into Rocket League at 1080p with high quality and high performance. Quality, yeah, no, no performance. Just all high quality settings. We see, again, a very similar story. Now you can see the scaling going from a base 3200G to a fully overclocked is pretty substantial. And the same thing can be said for the 3400G. Now Warframe gave the thing a, he gave all of these chips a really good run for their money. And this is one of the few times that you're gonna see the 3400G really separate itself from the 3200G, even when it's been fully overclocked and everything else. The 3400G with the extra stream processors and the compute units just handled that much better. Rainbow Six Siege actually pretty much impressed me with the overall performance here. Even with the 3200G with a slight memory overclock, performs reasonably well and again, the fully overclocked 3200G matches the 3400G with the memory overclock, but the fully enabled 3400 runs away with it. Now I did step into the world of Blizzard and we took a look at Diablo 3 and we did this run in West March and I did about, 
I did five runs at uh, 30 seconds a piece where I ran into fi crowds fighting. And that's where we got these averages. And once again, you see here, the 3400G does carry a substantial performance benefit unless you've got the 3200G fully overclocked. Then it comes, well, right there in line with the 3400G with the memory overclock. The, then we did step into World of Warcraft with 1080p and the graphics set to 7 and ran across Dawning Valley. So I'm not very familiar with World of Warcraft. I haven't played it in years, but the performance here was not bad at all. In fact, the 3400G with the memory overclock and the GPU overclock, well, it was fairly smooth. I actually played it for quite a while with that setting after testing, doing all the testing. Now moving things out of actual games and we want to take a look at thermals as well as power draw and I know it may sound crazy with power draw on something this small but the reality is you may want to put this in a very tight enclosure that may have an integrated power supply and it's a good idea to know what kind of power the whole system is pulling when it's under heavy load. So another thing to keep in mind is this was the cooler used for the 3200G and the 2400G, while this was the cooler to use for the 3400G, because I did all the thermal testing with the cooler that they came with, because with the prices, if you were gonna buy this cooler, or this processor, and then buy a $30 cooler for it, you really should just buy this one and get the better cooler and the better performance out of the box. You get real funny when you get into these lower price tier, because every dollar counts, all right? So that out of the way, Let's take a look at power draw and then we'll look at how that translates into thermals. So power draw shows the 3000 series is up just a little bit over the 3400G. But on uh, that's as, as far as idle goes, but under load, you see the 3200 pulling less, the 3400G pulling slightly more. But you see when you fully unlock it, you see the performance kind of really run away on the 3400G. They both they they pull quite a bit and that's where it gets real tricky because you got you're looking at 170 watts versus 145 watts. So if you're within a power constraint, you really want to take a look at just where you want to be on that one and kind of stick within that. If you were really worried about power and you wanted the performance, that 3400G with the memory overclock looks like a good spot to be in. Now, how does this translate to thermals? Well, what you see on the screen here, we've got several different things. We've got the CPU idle, a CPU load, GPU idle, and the GPU load. Because they're both on the same die and the same package, being cooled by the same cooler, they, they, they impact each other pretty heavily. And you can see here, under stock conditions, under load, even under idle, the, the temperatures are fine. The 3200G gets a bit quite a bit warmer than the 3400G, but again, remember the mass of the cooler. But when you start to overclock these things, you see here that 3200G pushes right up against the thermal envelope for that CPU. It's a TJ Maxx of 95, and you're hitting 93 on it, because that, again, that GPU is pushing up the temperature of that CPU to keep it running. So they kind of go in tandem there. So at the end of the day, it becomes a really, a, re a real balancing game here. My recommendation here is do not overspend on the memory. Whenever the, the 2000 series came out, memory was really scarce and really expensive. And we're talking to get good performance. If you wanted this level of performance, you're spending 150 plus dollars on a kit of RAM. This is 45 bucks. So you run in the thing, you pair it with this CPU, $145. You pair it with this one, just at $200. The 3200G is a really, really good part. And if you're more willing to tweak with it, probably get the performance that you wanted out of this. Uh, if you wanted the better out of the box with just adding the memory overclock and not having to go too deep into the the, the, uh, the UEFI and the BIOS and really tweaking things out, the 3400G may suit you better. And the thermals are better and it runs quieter. Man, this really is kind of a which one. If it was me and I was planning on buying a graphics card later down the road for it, I would not go down to a straight quad core. I would want that SMT. I would want the extra cock core clock that the CPU gets with this one. And the GPU performs admirably for what it is. And the Ryzen 3 3200G would probably be my bet if I was not going to add a GPU and I was gonna build an ITX system and it was gonna be a little Johnny's computer that he does his homework and does a little bit of gaming, say Minecraft, or even the games that we looked at over here. Now remember, these were all at 1080p and they were all getting right around that 60 FPS mark. So they were all playing pretty good. So 
high-end enthusiasts, guys, please look higher. Please look at dedicated G uh, CPUs like the even the Intel Core i5s if you want to, uh, or the the Ryzen 5, the 3600 and up, or even the Ryzen the the previous generations with the six or eight cores. But as these are very niche. These are what you're going to want to use if you're going to be on a home theater PC that you're going to play light games on, not heavy AAA games. Now, a lot of the games that have been given away for free on the Epic Game Store all run great on here. A lot of the games that you get on the Xbox Live Game Pass run great on here. I was even playing Forza Horizon 4 at 1080p, low settings, mind you, but on the 3400G with the overclocked memory. It was sitting around 60 FPS, so that was pretty neat. I didn't take performance numbers because whatever. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on these newer APUs. I know a lot of people aren't touching on these very much because they're just not as exciting as seven nanometer, high core count, high frequency parts, but they do serve a purpose and I feel like they do it very well. There's a lot of people that could benefit from something like this. Love to hear your thoughts on that down in the comment section below. This has been Keith with WCCF Tech TV. Make sure you're subscribed and hit that notification bell so that we don't miss you in the next one.